Welcome everyone. I am very excited to be here with the Central New Jersey Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today's guest is David Shuckman. David is an information technology professional with a true passion for technology implementation as well as application design, development, and IT operations. Dave is a seasoned IT professional with over 30 years of experience and where he spent the last 12 years of his corporate career as an IT leader in the financial services, transportation, and healthcare industries. Presently, David is an information technology services training and management consultant with his own company, Princeton Tech Advisors. Um, Dave is an active leader in the job seeker support community. He's the current executive chair of the professional service group of Mercer County and Princeton, which I've been fortunate enough to visit. In addition, Dave is a co-facilitator for New Jersey job seekers in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and he's on the boards of the career support group at St. Gregory the Great in Hamilton, New Jersey, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey in East Brunswick. Additionally, David is often requested to present topical programs and IT training classes to business groups, adult schools, job seeker support groups, and public libraries. So please help me welcome David Shuckman. Great, thank you. And I'm pressing too many buttons at one time, so trying to quiet my cell phone. There we go, let's go back to that. Give me a second to quiet my cell phone. Not sure why it rang. Good. So I um, want to thank everybody for um, coming to this presentation from the Central New Jersey Regional Chamber of Commerce. And uh, because of the uh, sheltering in place, of course, we, unfortunately, we have not been able to meet in person as a group, but we are maintaining our uh, monthly meetings as now Lunch and Learns online. And so I have the opportunity to present this to you. Uh, later, uh, the video of this will be available online. And so it'll be on our YouTube channel, the Chamber's YouTube channel. We will take care of that at that time as well. Um, as a webinar, sometimes it's a little bit hard to ask questions or to interrupt, but I do have an intermission slide about halfway through. So if you don't mind maybe holding your questions until about halfway through, and then after the second half at the end, uh, we'll, we'll take a break at those times to answer questions and you can unmute yourself at that time. So I think that'll make it for a bit more efficient uh, program and also not stepping on each other uh, verbally at all. So uh, the idea of this program is, uh, it's called Websites Best Practices for Small Business. And this is an introduction program. So I wanna make sure that you understand some of the topics, uh, be exposed to them, uh, understand that these are um, maybe new to some people and uh, or maybe for some of you, you've known about these, but give you an idea to be exposed to these. Then you have the opportunity to maybe deep dive either on your own I'll be happy to talk with you offline, or if you have your own web developer, you could talk to that person as well for some of the information that we talked about. Also, by the end of the slide deck, I'll let you know where you can download these slides. So if you wanna download them and take them with you, you're certainly welcome to as well. So let us get right into it to get started. And the first thing is, let's just kind of level set the whole discussion and talk about, well, what is really a website? And basically, a website is kind of a central location of these things called web pages. And they all tend to be related. They have common content. And they could all be accessed through an internet browser. And I think, you know, this is uh, basic for a lot of you, but uh, you, you probably know this already. A web page, it's a document that's on the website. And it's accessible also through the internet browser. We're very familiar with clicking in a website to go to different web pages. And not sure if you were aware, but each web page on your website actually has its own web address, that URL code. And the internet browser, that's the software program that we use to access easily uh, the internet, also known as the World Wide Web. And that's kind of why the www is in front of each website that you have. So about the structure, about the content of a website, websites need to be hosted on a server. And what basically that means is that's the program, that's the, that's the place, the server is the place where all the programming and the content is stored. Now, if you've built your own website, you might've used your own desktop computer or your own PC, but likely you're connected to some service and that service has a server. 
if you wanted to run the website only on your own computer, well, your PC would have to be on 24-7 and have necessary programs to display as a host a website. So it typically runs on a server, a bigger computer where all the website and programming content. So you can have your own server. That's certainly something you can do. Um, there are lots of hosting companies. We're going to talk about those in a few minutes. And the website content is made up of lots of different things, including the text, the written content that you're writing about, um, images, graphics, charts, those sorts of things. They all can be put onto your website. Video and animation, anything that moves, um, uh, turns out to be very good content for a website. And links to other websites or to your social media sites. And that's very strong We'll talk later about search engine optimization. That's very strong for search engine optimization. So these are the typical types of content that you need to have or prepare in order to put on your website. And there's kind of two broad categories of websites. And one is fairly static websites. They're not really very good at allowing engagement by your audience. And we're gonna talk about engagement a little later, but they tend to be very informational oriented. They are really kind of a one-way communication to get the information from the website to the reader. You've probably seen Wikipedia or other wiki type websites where you're clicking among the pages, but you're not otherwise engaged besides what you're reading. Frequently asked questions where you can look, read the question and get the answer. Um, a lot of times uh, business and product services that are being displayed, if there's any portfolio that you wish to show off, uh, the work that you have, photographs and of work, Podcasts tend to be one way, and documents and photos to download. And so it tends to be a very static relationship where the viewer really is just getting the information that you're providing. And there are also interactive or dynamic websites, and they really do much better for engaging and allowing interactivity between you, your organization, as the website owner, and your visitors. So uh, business applications where the people have to maybe do some sort of data entry, those tend to be very good for being interactive. E-commerce, we're going to talk more about that later also. Uh, E-commerce is where you're buying things online. And so you're, whether it's products or services, and so you're engaging the user, they're very active. And what we call portals, which is kind of a business application, the kind that typically users have their own account and they can do their own things on it. And so also engages and keeps the people very active. Now you have to decide for yourself based on your type of business or the products or services that you wanna discuss or make available, what makes the most sense for you. But these are the two broad categories of websites. So why websites are so important? Well, basically, your customers expect you to have one. Uh, imagine if you uh, met somebody, you might be interested to hire them, and you said, I like what you have to say, give me your business card. And they said, oh, I don't even have a business card. You might think that's a little odd. People are expected in business to have a business card. Well, they are expected to have a website as well. People are searching for products and information online, and you know that to be true because you do that. We're all searching online very regularly. And so when people are searching for products and information similar to what you have, you need to be found on your website. Professional websites also give you and your brand, who you are, what people talk about you, uh, credibility. It really validates you as a business and you as a professional. Sometimes you can also influence people's decisions. You can educate them. You can provide information to help them make a better informed decision. Um, you can also update your customers on things that are new with your organization. You've got some offers, special offers, discounts, maybe new products that are coming to market. You're going to be at an event and you want to alert people there as well. You can do that on your website. Now you can do these things on other web websites and services as well, but certainly your website can can do that. If you are not yet known, if your business is not yet known, this is where people find out about you. So if you only have a small circle of clients and you want to expand a little, uh, websites are where people will find out about you because they'll do a search in Google and Bing. The search results always are some form of website. And essentially, if you're not found online or if your business is not found online, it's functionally irrelevant because people are searching for someone like you they're searching for a business like yours. And if they don't find it because you don't have a website, they're not calling you. So to, to them, you're irrelevant. And I can tell you with 110% certainty that this is accurate. 
this statement, if you're not bound online, you're irrelevant, because I put it in bold red, and I would not have put it in bold red if it was not true and important. So let's get into some of the website best practices. There's certainly lots and lots. We're going to, again, just kind of talk about this on a high level, but make sure that you know about some of the important ones. You certainly want your website to be mobile friendly or what us tech people called a responsive design. And basically what that means, your web pages can be viewed or the program delivers them on various screen sizes. And here we have pictures of desktops and laptops and tablets and phones. And you can see the screens are different sizes. So the layout of the screens adapts to the screen size, all the way from a mobile, I'm sorry, from a desktop computer, which tends to be a wide screen, and pretty big, to a tablet, which is kind of square, to a mobile phone, which is narrow, and the text is very small. So if you look at a website on your phone, let's say, and it just looks like a regular website, very, very tiny, like an eye chart, it's not mobile friendly. You want to make sure it's mobile friendly. For us developers, it's really the most flexible way for us to design a website, for us making them mobile. Um, as a matter of fact, it, it's really the only way we do it going forward. It doesn't cost extra. There's nothing like that. Um, but you just have to make sure that it's mobile friendly. You may have an older website, a few years old, that's not mobile friendly. Uh, you may want to convert it to be such. It'll be easier for people to look at online. And if your audience tends to be a little bit younger, Millennials are age right now are age 22 to 38. 20% of millennials don't even have a desktop or laptop. They're not using that bigger screen. They're using the tablet or the phone. So you want to make sure that the website and the web pages and all the content can be served up and presented to them in a format that they're going to be reading very easily. About some of the content, we said, you know, the text and the images and the and the um, video. You certainly want to be descriptive. You don't want to be limiting, but you don't want it to be too wordy. So you're not going to put a Magna Carta on your home page. You're really going to be, uh, uh, it's got to be kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's got to be just right. It does have to be descriptive. People need to get right away what the content is about, but don't stuff it too much. Um, you want to put what's called keywords. Keywords are the phrases or the words that people use in a Google or Bing search. And you want to make sure that those words are going to be on your website. Now, there are some Google tools that help you optimize the best words to put in your website. And once you find some of those key words, um, you're going to want to update and write content that includes those. And these have to be the words and phrases that other people are going to use to look for you. It may not just be what you think. You may be thinking in business terms, they may be thinking in layperson terms, and you're going to want to put more of the layperson terms if your audience are going to be lay people. Uh, Google has some tools that does allow you to kind of ask Google, how are people searching for words like this? And um, you know, those are the ones that you're going to want. We can't deep dive into that topic right here. Just want to let you know that there are tools available for you to use. Adding images, adding video, certainly it adds interest to the website. And actually, in um, for Google, Google happens to like to see websites that have images and video. It's not actually watching the video, or looking at the pictures, but Google understands this to be a more relevant website than just a wordy website. So you do want to add images and video of interest and that uh, make a point to support the point that you're writing in your text. Also, have links to other websites. And sometimes that seems almost counterintuitive. Why do I want people off my website? But in the search engine optimization world, Google actually likes that because it's almost like you are, you are kind of telling Google the world you live in, technically. And um, you're, you're doing an online digital reference. And there are ways to get people to link to other websites with actually, actually not making your website go away. So it's easy for your viewers to come right back to your website. So other websites could be your social media sites, if you have a Facebook page, LinkedIn page, or others. Um, maybe some of the products uh, that you sell, but from the vendor's website. So if you're selling a, a particular type of service or particular type of product, but you're actually reselling it from a, a vendor, you might link to the original source page. Now, we would talk about that in more detail, do so with your web de designer, but that's the kind of links that you're interested in. And also, 
across all of your web pages and all the sections on your website, your web content has to kind of have a common theme. So when I write here, the sell a tell a consistent story, you're not writing a novel, you're not writing a story that way, but kind of the theme of the website from page to page should be pretty much about the same thing. You might be selling products. You talk about that on one page. You may be selling services to install those products. That could be in another web page. But the theme of it should always be about the, the business that you have. So that you're installing uh, services. Your services are for those products. The products are for those services. Um, if not, the website can be very confusing to people. Uh, one fellow that I know created one website that combines his business and his personal pleasures. And I thought he was incorrect in doing so. He insisted on doing it. But it means that his personal friends have to look at his business pages and his business friends have to look at his personal pages. And it's just confusing. In that case, have a second website. That's what he really should be doing. So keep your website cons constant, the con content constant. You also want to have references to your location. Most of us in small business, our business is primarily local, and that's called local search engine optimization. So if you think about it, if you were doing a Google search and over 20% of searches in Google are local, you might put something like business counseling services, Mercer County, as opposed to just business counseling. And the reason why is if you're in Mercer County or close by, you're probably going to want to speak to a business counselor, if that's the service you're interested, who's fairly close, easy for you to get to. Now, of course, you can uh, look for a business counselor across the country. You're welcome to do that. But there may be benefits to working with someone locally. A lot of small businesses, we primarily look at a small ge geographic area. It works out very well. Um, so you'll want to add some location and local contact information on every page. Um, use local search terms in your keywords. So you might have on your About Us page, we are the finest business counseling service in Mercer County. Just write that right away on your page or in New Jersey or in Pennsylvania. And um, you also can update and change your web addresses. So your web address for each page might be uh, www.mycompany.com slash about us. It's the about us page. You might rename that page to about us Mercer County, New Jersey, putting those same keywords there. So that also helps Google understand more about the location. Local searches are more and more relevant in Google. A lot of times when you do a Google search, it even asks, may I use your location? Because it wants to give you search results that are very relevant. So another thing to add uh, is what we call calls to action, basically telling people or giving people something to do. So call to action could be an image or text, something that prompts the uh, website or the social media site, if you're doing it on your social media, for them to take some sort of action. So something like sign up for a newsletter. And what's nice about that and that image on the bottom, sign up for a newsletter, they're putting in their email address. Now you've got their email address. You may be able to email them at some point in the future. Download some free information. Uh, download information, usually in exchange for an email address. Or um, if it's an e-commerce site, you want to make it very easy for them to buy quickly. So it could even be just something like that, something to engage them very quickly. This one is from Amazon, get free two-day shipping. So it does help um, engage the users, keep them on the website. So you want to keep people uh, engaged, staying on your website and you want your messages to be even more effective, calls to action can be something that can do that. And you have to decide for your website, the services that you're gonna offer, what is the best call to action for yourself and your business. You also will wanna promote your website content in other places. It's not just good enough to publish your website content, you really need to let your customers know about it. Because just because your website gets published brand new, People don't know about it just yet. Uh, you want to let all your customers uh, provide them information that's helpful to them. And then again, it becomes a bit of engaging, but information that's helpful to them, they're going to want to um, uh, use your website and hopefully you more often. So your content really has to be about what's important to them and less so about what's important to you. You can do it through social media. You could do email marketing. There are lots of ways you can promote your website. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, search engine optimization later. Pay-per-click is another one. We're not really getting into that too much, but um, that's also available. Um, your website 
and other social media platforms. So you will want to be on at least one social media platform, hopefully the one that your customers and your clients would be using. So there is no other de definition of what's the best social media platform. It's the one where your customers are going to be. But you'll want to add buttons, and those buttons will have links to your social media site so visits, visitors can connect with you on social media. They can like your content. They can begin to engage with you in other places. They may also be very familiar with using Facebook or YouTube or, or Twitter, and you get to keep them looking for you there. You'll also want to show some stats, especially on your social media sites, how many views and clicks that you have, because it's, it validates exactly the content that you're putting on. If you have a blog on your website as well, you'll want to have similar information statistics for that as well to demonstrate the importance of the content to your audience. Okay, so here's the first intermission. And so um, I think what may be a good thing to do is, um, well, at this point, just uh, unmute yourself if you got a question and we'll answer it. Or Dave. raise your hand. Yeah, hi, Dave. I'll raise my hand. Uh, so, David, if there there is a, a business that really is only going to use one social media, uh, is it really necessary to put all those buttons right across? So if you find that you have a lot of um, action on LinkedIn, do, should we really be putting Twitter and everything else, even though we could be doing that? So my earlier comment was that you want to be on the social media platforms that are most relevant to your audience. And right. your audience would be your, your clients or your prospects. They could also be your competitors. Uh, the reason why is if your competitors figured out where to be, you want to be showing up in the same place that they are. If you only have one button instead of three or four, put the one button. Yep. Right. Great. Thanks, David. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Anything Thank else, you. folks? Andrea raised her hand. Okay. Well, speak up, Andrea. <laughs> Okay, um, regarding uh, linking my website to other websites, how do I assure that whoever clicks on that link to one of my partners or whatever, they're gonna be able to get back to my site? So when we create links in websites, um, there's usually a setting associated with it. There's actually the code that's there. There's usually a setting, it's like a checkbox. And it's, the checkbox will have some terminology like open the link in a new window, something like that. What that essentially means is you've probably seen on your browser that you might have multiple tabs open. You might have your email open, your Amazon and your shopping and other. Uh -huh. e well, in the new tab, when you click on that, a new tab will open, new window right next to yours. They can go surf that website and your your website will remain one of the tabs right on the top. Okay. If you don't do that, then the website that they're clicking to will completely replace yours. And if they do some searching through the website, that other website, they either have to re-enter your web address or hit the back button a bunch of times. And that's just nasty. And it's, that's discouraging. Okay. Yeah. yeah but it's Thanks. a setting, it's a setting in all these web tools for links. Um, okay. Yep. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. All right, so if you don't mind, please mute yourselves again and we will get ourselves going. Some, some of us may remember when there were intermissions at the movie theater and the curtain had to open again. So I wanted to talk just a little bit, and again, at a high level about e-commerce, electronic commerce. It's basically um, purchasing products or services electronically, uh, typically the internet. So e-commerce does not have to be just purchasing products. And we know a lot of the big uh, online stores. You could also contract for services as well. Um, hosting a website is contracting a service. So that may be one. Um, it's also known as online shopping. So depending on the nature of your business, you may be able to offer some of your products or services to your clients directly uh, online. Um, what's nice about it is there's no barriers. You don't have to worry about uh, distance to your clients, time of day that they're ordering. So you could eventually, essentially be up and running for your, sa your sales 24 seven all, all around the world. So there's really no barrier for time or distance. 
there are a bunch of e-commerce tools that are out there and they're kind of web development tools, but they are customized for e-commerce. Um, one of them is eBay. A lot of us have heard of eBay. They started in the mid nineties as really an auction site, but they've mostly moved uh, to online shopping. And what you could probably see next to that Michael Kors bag, it's $64.95, buy it now. So they're not bidding on it, they're buying it right now. Another is Amazon. And uh, there are over a million Amazon stores or Amazon sellers that are not Amazon. They use the Amazon platform. And uh, this is actually a mat that I bought from this company, Matt's Factory. It's actually the, uh, the backdoor mat that I use. And so uh, you can sell through Amazon, certainly. Now, when you use a service like eBay and Amazon, they tend to take a little bit higher percentage of the sale. And some people initially get frustrated by that. But think about it. You don't need to have a real store. And you're not paying a, a monthly charge for your website for hosting. So it, it can really be very cost efficient if you do that properly. You could certainly on your own website have buy it now buttons like on this website. So this one is selling some coaching services, a one month, three month and six month package. This is a service that's being sold. You could just put uh, a PayPal button or something similar, merchant processor button on your website and you could sell a service or a product right through it. And then there are these other e-commerce platforms, Shopify, BigCommerce, Volusion. These are basically web development tools. You can actually build a regular website with them but they've got all the functionality needed for um, e-commerce. Things like if you were selling a shirt and the shirt came in different colors and different sizes, that kind of setup is done very easy with tools like these. If you use the regular web platform and you did not have that built in, you'd have to kind of write that program yourself or have lots of pictures displayed differently. Here, it just takes care of it nicely. So these tools work out very well. Again, just giving you the names of these, we're not going to deep dive into how to set this up, but just wanted to let you know that these are out there. Um, there are some best practices with e-commerce as well. You certainly want to make a good first impression, good copy, good images. Um, it really has to demonstrate the product well. I'm not sure that this guy, uh, hopefully that's not his prom date that he's going to meet. I'm not sure he's making a good first impression but you want to. Uh, you want to make sure that it does display well on mobile devices. Again, lots of people are using mobile devices for purchases. And ideally, have a place where you can show testimonials and customer reviews, because good customer reviews really help validate the purchase that people are about to make. You also want to make it easy to, to pay, to, I'm sorry, to make the purchase. Um, you want to show all the prices up front. There are a couple of retailers or e-tail versions of the retailers, and they will have something like um, add it to your shopping cart and then we'll show you the price. I think that's a little underhanded. Uh, now it's in the shopping cart. They're hoping someone will say, all right, I'll buy it anyway. Make it easy for people. Um, also give them a appealing shipping options. Lots of uh, online companies are doing free shipping and make checkout nice and quick and easy. Good best practice for e-commerce. But best of all, or most of all, be prepared to fulfill the orders. Because if you happen to become very successful with e-commerce, make sure that you can turn over filling the packages, putting the mailing labels on the boxes, getting them to the shipper very quickly, because that will lead to a very good reputation. Uh, so don't become overwhelmed. So make sure that preparing for fulfilling orders is part of your plan as well. In terms of regular websites, some popular platforms that are out there, we're not gonna compare them in great detail, but just let you know what's out there. Um, Squarespace is one of the big companies that's out there. Um, they basically are very good for beginners and intermediates to build a website. Uh, <clears throat> their personal plans start as low as $12 a month. Business plans have a few more options. Um, it does include all the hosting, everything that you'll be needing to put on your website. Um, they already have pre-designed templates, not the written content, not the photographs, not the video, but the different structures and organizations of the website. And then typically as you start putting content in Squarespace, it's kind of drop and drag. So you need very little programming skill, if any, to do that. Wix is another one that's very similar. 
uses drop and drag tools, really no coding programming skill. So similar to Squarespace, uh, you can set up uh, websites pretty easily. They have a basic Wix builder for free. In that case, you would not be able to use your own domain. So if you had your own website domain, mycompany.com, um, they really don't make it easy to do that. Uh, there's tricks to get around it, but it's not really a good way. Uh, but then their subscriptions, $13 a month. That includes the server, the storage space, everything you need on the website. Weebly, another big company, kind of similar to them, these big web builders. Um, you can drop and drag, very similar to, Weeb, uh, to Wix. Um, and again, they have a basic website builder for free. You can't use your own domain. Also with the free service, they usually have the logo of Weebly, the logo of uh, Wix, uh, a very professional site, probably shouldn't have the web builder's logo there. So that's why you start looking at subscription uh, for that as well. And they start at $6 a month, which is pretty reasonable. Uh, the biggest platform in the market right now is called WordPress. Uh, WordPress is uh, acquired two different ways. You can actually go to WordPress, just like you can go to Weebly and Squarespace and, and get your WordPress website set up there. Um, uh, you could also use a hosting company like GoDaddy or some of the others, and um, uh, they'll install the WordPress for you, and then you build the website on their platform using the WordPress programming. Um, but if you use WordPress, through them directly. Their program starts at about $4 a month. Um, and then um, uh, you have a lot more options when you start going with the more wordpress.org or install it on a hosting company. Um, if you need more details about that, let's talk about it online. But about a third of websites in the marketplace right now, 33 to 40% are built on the WordPress platform. It's very popular. Oops. Now, if you go with a hosting company, for instance, if you want to get WordPress, not from them directly, but through one of the hosting companies, or a lot of these hosting companies have their own web design platforms. Um, there's just a bunch that are out there. Um, some of them can be free or have a free model, um, but in most cases, you're much better off with one of the subscriptions because the free models can be very limited in features and functionality. So they can start as low as just a few dollars a month. Uh, the bigger the subscription, the more functionality that you get. Some of the popular ones here, Google uh, is a great hosting platform, one-on-one uh, -on -one web hosting, HostGator, GoDaddy, Amazon Web Services, also known as AWS, Bluehost. So here's just a bunch of them. And if you don't have time to take a screenshot of this, no worries, this slide deck will be available a little later today. Now your website domains, you also have to make sure you have a website domain, your www.mycompany.com. They're also known as URLs, and the URL that actually means Uniform Resource Locator, that's what the acronym means. In the IT world, there are just lots of acronyms, this is one of them, but it's basically your website address. I'm sure you ask people all the time, what's your web address? And so that's what it is. Um, you generally, register these, it's kind of like renting them. You don't buy them permanently, although you could have automatic renewal, so it just doesn't expire. Uh, a lot of registration companies, the hosting companies will do the registration for you. Um, you can acquire, acquire them for a term of one year to as far as 10 years, you just prepay. Uh, the advantage of prepaying, if you do it that way, uh, protects you from a price increase through the term. Um, Right. It's not terribly expensive, depending on the service you use and the services that they give you as part of the acquisition, the registration, uh, $10 to $20 a year. So um, it's, it's usually a, a, a good investment. Also, if you're starting to form a business, it's a good idea to get your domain sooner rather than later. Get the domain, maybe two or three of them, hold on to them until you decide which one you actually want to use. You want to make sure that people like squatters don't just come up and buy the domain or, or hold the domain on their own. Um, this is not an illegal practice. There are people that will go and find domains and spend the $10 each, hoping that someone like you may want it from them and they'll sell it for hundreds or thousands of dollars. And so some of them will sell for a big pro profit. The only time this is actually is illegal is if a squatter squats on a trademarked name for the domain. So a squatter is not likely to get IBM or Coca-Cola anytime soon. Those are trademarked. 
Let's talk about search engine optimization. This is really very important. Now, search engine optimization, I kind of have this circle here. We won't go into great detail, unfortunately, right now. Uh, I do a separate search engine optimization presentation. But basically what happens, it's a little bit of an iterative process. We do some analysis, or you can do on your own. There's keyword searches and reviews that you do. You look at your competitors, how they're seen online. And, and then you start moving on to uh, promoting that content and, and making it available on your website. Well, this could be an iterative circle. You may go through this a few times until you hone it just right. And that's why it's built as a circle. And that's what it is. And the reason why, you know, people want to make sure that when they build their website, people will come to it. And that becomes very important. But in the real world, when you build your website, people don't come to it. They don't know about you yet. So unlike that movie, if you build it, they will come. That doesn't happen. We need to start promoting our website content. If your website is not found, and here's a case, I was searching for a business like yours, and look what came up, four instances of your competition, but not you. Again, like I said before, if your website or your business are not found, they're irrelevant. They're just not being seen. But your competitors are, and they have the opportunity to earn this piece of business. So what is search engine optimization? It's also known as SEO. It's really the process of gaining visibility in search engine results. And the goal is to then drive user traffic to your website. And we say the process is organic. It doesn't really happen instantaneously, but in the search engine world, it really begins to happen a little bit slowly over the course of a few weeks and few months. And, but uh, it's really a very natural and slow process. It's not instantaneous. There are ways to get instantaneous results, but that's not what search engine optimization is. And there are basically two primary components of search engine optimization. One that's called on-page SEO. The other is called off-page SEO. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. And why is search engine important? optimization important is you have to understand how search engines actually work. So you've probably seen Google, Bing, Yahoo, or the others. You have a search word or term that you want to put right in the web page, and that's what happens. But this is how it doesn't work. What a lot of people mistakenly think is that what will happen is Google will instantly go out and search every website on every server in every city, state, and country in the world in order to return all those results, a million or more, in 1.1 seconds. And that's not what happened. Google does not search, Bing does not search the internet right at the moment that you're doing your search. Instead, what Google and the search engines really do is they're doing searches night and day without you. They're just searching for everything on the internet. And they have these little programs that are called bots, like robots or spiders, because spiders crawl the world wide web. And they're just finding stuff and they will find your website and your web pages. And they're gonna send that stuff back to Google and Google will store that in their database. And then night and day, Google's churning through all this information just to make sense of it. And eventually Google does, it's an incredible process that they have. So your search results are really a list of information that's found in their database. And so you really want to make sure that the information that you put in your website, as I mentioned earlier, tells a consistent story, a relevant story, page to page, because that will help Google put all those little things together and point to your website in a, in a search result. So he said it's made up of two components, on-page SEO and off-page SEO. And so what on-page SEO, it's the stuff that's on your web page, whether visibly, or hidden behind the scenes. And the reason why it's called on page, it's what you can do, what you can change on your website. Your page content, you can optimize the text with keywords uh, or with the location, the local SEO that we mentioned a little bit earlier. You can put a lot of that in on your own. And if you're not the web savvy person, of course, call your web programmer that you've contracted. That person can do it for you as well. There are some hidden fields as well. Something called a title tag is one of them. And uh, a lot of times, if you're not careful, um, when you build your website, you're actually not populating that. But there's ways to make sure that you do. Some of the web builder tools point you in the right direction, some don't, but you wanna make sure that it does, because Google actually looks for these hidden fields like this title tag. Um, also, uh, you wanna make sure your URL, as I mentioned a little bit earlier with local SEO, 
has actually uh, a name that makes a lot of sense. So here's Princeton Tech Advisors, mine, and the page is called Technology Services. And so at the very least, when Google scratches its head, it'll say, oh, this must be a web page of technology services. And so that becomes important. I actually worked with a client about a year ago, and each one of the web pages was named page one, page two, page three, page four. And so as we began to talk about it, we said, I demonstrated that Google just didn't know what the meaning of this web page is. So it's a little confusing. So you can make sure your web page URL has the right name. Another hidden field are these things called meta tags or meta descriptions. This is data about the data of your page. Now you or I using the website will never see these fields, the web, the meta description, maybe we won't even see the title tag or others, uh, but Google does, Bing does, they look at these. So we make sure that the proper meta descriptions and tags are filled in as well. You have to make sure you do that for your search engine optimization. And the other kind that's very important are called alt tags. Those are on images. You may remember the old days, and probably they are pretty old, when you used to take pictures with a camera with film, and then after it was finished, um, you put the pictures in a photo album. And you might have even put on the back of the picture a description of what that picture is. You know, it might be, you know, you and the kids at a lake, and you can say, oh, 1980 vacation at the lake. And then you put that in uh, your photo album so that if years later you open up the album you can see what the note was and it tells you exactly what it is digitally pictures that show up on websites or put on website have that kind of electronic place behind them as well and those are called alt tags and some other places as well and you want to make sure that you put them with the right information about the picture and about your website now sometimes if you download images uh, from the website you do it legitimately and you download them from services like uh, Shutterstock or Getty Photos, they come with their own alt tags already in them. You wanna remove theirs and put in yours because it might be a picture of two men and a lady at a desk. Well, that's fine and may be very relevant to what you wanna show, but the alt tag about you might be more business services. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you change it to be in line with your website. And that's what optimizes the on-page SEO. Off-page SEO, the opposite of on-page, refers to activities by others outside of your website. And that gives you a lot of credibility. But it becomes a little bit harder for you to manage off-page SEO because you may not have access to websites that are not your own. But it does give an indication to Google and the search engines of how the world outside perceives your website. The most important would be what we call link building or cross-linking. You want to have people and businesses, their websites have links to your websites. You also want to have links on your websites to theirs. Good ones to be connected with, again, your vendors, your, your service providers, organizations like that that are very similar to yours. If you sell a bunch of products, you may want to link to the manufacturer's homepage. Best case, they'll have a list of their uh, providers and you could be on there as well. But an easier place for you, your social media. If you have those couple of social media sites, on those sites, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn page, have links cross-linking right back to your website. And have content on the social media that talks about your business, and then it links to your website, which talks about your business. And Google really likes that. It's almost like a, a digital validation. Very helpful. So some ways to improve your search engine optimi optimization. Start with your on-page SEO. It's your website, it's, you have the access, you're in control. Just start there first. Then, and, and doing those things we did before, the alt tags, the, the content, the keywords, put that all there. Then start working on the off-page SEO. It does take a little bit more time. You are working on other sites. Maybe you're posting up content on other blogs. Maybe you're trying to get articles posted. Um, you have to reach out to a bunch of website owners to see if they're willing to put your link on their website, make them an offer, and you'll do the same for them. So it does take a little bit longer to do, but these are ways to improve your SEO from that perspective. Let's also talk about analytics. Analytics really gives you a way to begin to monitor the performance of your website. So you have a website, 
And you really don't know how many people are coming to look at it. Now, if people are calling you and say, hey, I saw this on your website, that's really the best way to say that your website is being found easily online. But there are tools that will do that as well. You want to be able to measure the results of your effectiveness of your website. Uh, your social media programs. You want to see what's working. You might put a bunch of keywords there. No one's contacting you. You change the keywords. People are contacting you. More, more views on your websites. It helps make helps you to make better decisions about the content that you're posting on your website. And you can ask yourself, am I achieving my goals? Do I have sales criteria? Do I have calls that I want to get? Am I, whatever it is you're trying to do, are you achieving those? But when you can go back to the wording and the text, the access on your website, um, that may be able to help you drive you to your goals. So using analytics, um, the most common one is a tool called Google Analytics. That's what you put on your website. It is completely free. Those web builder tools that I told you about, they make it very easy to do. So with your Google account or Gmail account, you get a free analytics account. And um, they, in the Google Analytics, they give you a, a code and you put that code in your website. And then now anytime anyone visits your website, your Google Analytics account is recording it. Uh, you can see where people are coming from. You can see what pages they're, they're coming to. If they've linked to you, where they came from, did they come from Google search, from other websites, directly entering it themselves? Um, are they high bounce rates? Are they landing in your site and leaving very quickly? see a lot of information. Uh, you see just about everything except specifically who the person is. But you can see where they're coming to right down from the zip code. So geographically works out very well. Social media has their own analytics and each site has different versions of it. Um, but they typically call these social media engagement. Uh, clicks, likes, follows, comments, those things. You get to see that in, in, a, in a dashboard as well. How many impressions, how many people are viewing your content and the information that you're writing about. So a lot of the social media sites build that in and give it to you as part of their service as well. Now, the analytics can't tell you what to do, but you can decide what to do with the information. So for, as example, you might look at your analytics over the course of three or six months <clears throat> and look at trends in compared to when you've made changes to your content. And then you could maybe make decisions on, on the performance based on that. So if you had high, uh, high visibility a while ago, you made some changes and it's come down, you may want to go back to the content that you had a while ago. You can decide what to do with it. And then you're able to fine tune your online strategy. So as we sum up, Websites are accessible through the internet. Again, this is websites basics. There are different types of websites. Uh, what you build is really based on your need, your purpose. Do you can do something business? Or you can do it personal. Is it static? Is it interactive? Is it going to be um, e-commerce? Lots of options that you have. And just because there are lots of options, it's not really, don't get caught with there are too many options. Really focus on the one that's best for you and do the one that's right for you. There are many development tools, many hosting platforms that are out there. Choose the one that you feel will meet your need, will meet your budget. Um, your need may be, it's gotta be very user friendly, I'm building it myself, or maybe a little bit differently. So you decide what makes sense. Search engine optimization, site analytics really help you understand the performance of your website and helps you fine tune your online strategy. Okay. So if you do want to find this slide deck, um, it's on my website. It, I don't know yet if it's going to be on the Chamber of Commerce website, but it is on mine. On my website, you click on workshops. And then on recently offered programs, it's the very first one that's there. You're welcome to download it. It's a PDF version of the file. Um, I always make all my presentations available. Um, there's another version of this program also, if you want to get that version of it. Might be a couple of slides that are different, but basically the same program. Go back over time, look at that as well. So again, you want to go to the workshops menu item and then click on the bottom at recently offered presentations and then a whole list will be there. If you're having trouble with that, you can just email or call me and I'll make sure that you get to it. So that's really the end. Any well, questions as we wrap up? 
Dave, I want to thank you so much for this presentation. I don't have a question right now, but that was incredibly informative. And I, I just, I can't wait to watch the recording again. I thought that was really excellent. A lot of information in a short period of time. And I'll see if anyone has any last minute questions for you uh, before I stop the recording. Sure. Steve? I have one question. Yes, Steve. Um, David, so my website uh, is uh, hosted at Just Host. And I use the Weebly program to uh, build the site and maintain the site. Okay. And uh, the free version of that. So um, now I also have a Gmail account and a Google account. So a Google business account. How would I access the Google Analytics for the site? So in your Google account, um, you know, once you're logged in, the website is analytics.google.com. And then in there, you can begin to set up and configure your Google Analytics. At the beginning, it's very little to set up. And they'll give you a code. I think it's G with eight digits or something like that. But they give you a numeric code. And that's going to be completely unique in the Google world. Once you have that code, there's going to be a place in your Weebly website someplace in the dashboard. I don't remember where it is in Weebly but probably somewhere in website properties or whatever the equivalent is. And you'll basically put that code in the one place. Weebly automatically makes sure it's available on each page. And the reason why Weebly does it is Weebly is template based. Even though you build pages, the pages are within the template. And then each page that it's on, the, the code is there. And then uh, with every click that you have anywhere on the website, uh, Google records it. Your analytics are only one day old. So whatever you're looking at today is based up through yesterday. 